There is a lot of perceived obstacles and barriers that pops up in one's mind when they're thinking about starting a business. And one of the most common questions I get asked a lot is, am I too old to start a business? Um, and another one is, am I cut out to be an entrepreneur if I'm not technologically savvy? And do I really need to learn all these complicated marketing tactics to get clients? Well, I say, what if there's a better way to approach starting a business, getting clients and marketing your work as a new entrepreneur and doing this with simple and uncomplicated ways where your current experience, where you're at and your personality type and even your age can be a resource for your success. Well, I'm Lydia Lee. I'm the work reinvention coach and small business strategist at Screw the Cubicle. And if you're new to this channel, don't forget to hit the subscribe and notification bell button to be the first to know when every new video hits this channel every week. So today it is time for one of my favorite segments called Cubicle Crashing Stories. Uh, and today I get to speak to Mary Schiller, who is a former coaching client of mine who reinvented her life and started a business at the age of 50. Uh, she's since moved from New York to her dream city of Paris, France, uh, and she's living there with her husband, Jeff, at the moment. Uh, she's now become an independent author. Uh, she's an accountability coach, and she started her business in 2016 from zero uh, and reaching six figures in year two. So keep watching this interview to learn how Mary eradicated limiting beliefs about being too old to start a business, um, how she just decided to decide <laughs> she was simply good enough to start. And we dig into some really cool ways that she simplified her business to earn a really great living without complicated technology or marketing tactics. And we both literally like lift the hood uh, on our businesses and we share with you very simple steps that we've taken to build a location independent business and much more humanized approaches to selling and marketing your work. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you for being here, Mary. Thanks, Lydia. It's so nice to see you today. Well, we had a great conversation last week, and that's what instigated this exact conversation that I was impromptu. And I said, Mary, you need to come on ASAP, and we need to talk about some of the stuff we talked about. And I think it's such a great topic and conversation today because I kind of want to get real raw and transparent and kind of break the myths of what people um, think are the obstacles and the hurdles that it takes to uh, start a business. But I also think that your story is really unique because in a lot of ways, I get, you know, one of the most common questions I get from people uh, that ask me, is this possible for me if I am someone in my 50s, someone that's in retirement, someone that have children, right? And in a lot of ways, I, I might not be able to honestly answer that because I'm not in that stage of life, nor do I have children. Uh, so getting you on board today is really going to help kind of, you know, see what happened with your life and what you did to make this simple for you and why you took that leap of faith. Um, and let's talk about that. So uh, I want to start by kind of, you know, for people who don't know you, um, what sort of instigated that, um, you know, this life and work reinvention in 2016, is that it? I, a while back? Yes. Uh, yes. And, and, you know, what, tell us more about it and why you have told me that uh, age wasn't an obstacle for you to go after, you know, living an unconventional life and starting a business. Gosh. Okay. So I'll, thanks, Lydia. So I'll go back uh, just a little bit to 2015. Uh, I had been in a job for, I think, seven years, something like that, for a really big institution. I won't name names. And I was really ready to get out. Like, you know, you know what that's about. I was like, I can't work here anymore. It just, just doesn't fit me. My skills aren't being valued. I got to get out. And I saw an opportunity to go work for a just getting started startup that had um, a business focus that was really up my alley. It had to do with publishing. And I was like, oh, that's cool, because I've been a writer for my whole career. So I went over to this startup, and <laughs> let's just say things didn't go as planned. Um, I realized almost instantly that I had made a terrible mistake in going to work for this company. And I thought, well, I'm just going to make the best of it and see if things evolve, because it was a new company. I thought, you know, they're just getting their footing. I'll, I'll give it a chance. And I actually was a really big contributor to the company. They had put me in place to do sales and I made a lot of sales for them. They were selling a very high end service. It started at like 10 or $15,000 and went up from there. And then I was also working with a whole bunch of their freelancers that they had uh, working for them. But after about six months, it became 
really obvious to me that I was not going to be able to continue working for them because I just had a major ethical problem with the way the company was being run. Mm. And um, the CEO at the time, the co-founder had said to us, you know, if you see me doing something wrong, I want you to come and tell me. And so I just went to him and I just said, you know, I was very honest and I said, this is what I see. And I just, it just doesn't work for me. And I was promptly fired. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I was like, oh, okay. Well, that was not helpful because I was planning to leave, but I don't have anything to go to. <laughs> it was like, this is not computing. Uh, what am I going to do? Right. You didn't plan for that ex exit plan just I, yet. It was that a was bit not my exit. Thrown at you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I thought I was going to have at least, you know, like a month or something to see what I could get going before exiting. And that isn't what happened. It was, it was really startling uh, to me, this firing. I had never been let go from a job before in my life. At that time, I was uh, 54 and I was staring at um, a very, very low bank account because we had had a major catastrophe um, that we had to pay for. I didn't have a job at the time. My husband wasn't working either. And I had probably about I'd say two to three months of living expenses in our savings account. And that was all that we had. And so I'm sitting there going, all right, well, what are my choices here? I could try to find some other kind of writing gig because I had done that and I knew that I could do that, but I didn't want to, you know, when you get to a point in your life, maybe other people can relate to this where you've been doing the same thing for a long time. And you're just like, I don't want to do it anymore. I don't want to wake up tomorrow and do that. I was good at it. I was good at writing other people's stuff like ghost writing and copywriting. I just didn't want to do it. Yeah. I, 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 going, I think definitely I've, I've had people message me after, you know, watching a video about you repurposing skills, for example, to start a business, which is obviously one of the things that I teach, but there are questions that it's like, what if I don't want to repurpose these skills exactly the same way that I want, have done them for 20 years and, and it's all I've known and it's been my body of work and it kind of feels like I'm chopping my left arm off, but how do I move forward from here? Yeah, exactly. And so, I mean, I should add that I knew that those skills that I had would be valuable to me in anything else that I did, but I just didn't want to make my living from them anymore. Right. And at the time I had had a personal blog for a few months that had gotten me about maybe 150 subscribers to an email list, maybe, maybe 200, but that would be the absolute max. I think it was under 200. And it was on sort of personal development. And I had had a lot of conversations with people about that topic over the past year or so. And I thought, you know, maybe I could just start to get paid to have those conversations. You know, could I be a coach? I didn't have any coach training, life coach training. Um, at that time, also, I had written a little ebook that I was giving away uh, for people who signed up to my little list. It was called the joy formula and people really liked it. And they asked me to put it on Amazon because they thought more people should see it. And I was like, you know, maybe there's something to this. So one day I got super brave. Basically I conjured up all my <laughs> courage and I put a page on my little blog about coaching services that I offered. And I remember this so distinctly, I calculated how much money I needed to earn to cover our bills. Mm. each month. And then I just set my prices based on that number. Yeah. I was like, well, I can't do this super cheap because I got to get the bills paid. So here's how much it's got to cost. And then I sent it out to my list and I said, Hey, I'm now a coach. <laughs> if you want to work with me, here's a link to get on a zoom call with me and let's talk about it. And that's how I started. Mm. It was really that simple. Also, and I should add this, I basically told everybody that I knew at the time, like all my Google contacts and stuff that I was going to be a coach. And so pretty much I had no shame in telling people what I was up to. And a lot of people were kind of like, what are you talking about? You're a writer. And I'm like, yeah, not anymore. I'm this now. <laughs> you know? So I just kind of put myself out there. I didn't have anything to lose at that point. I was, you know, looking into sort of the financial abyss and going, well, you know, right. if this doesn't work out, I'll go back to writing, I guess. And that's how I started. It was really that simple. I love that because, you know, there is, um, you know, this process that I think that is 
needing to decide to decide <laughs> that I am now this person. You know, when I get emails a lot from, you know, as, um, aspiring writers, for example, they'll say, I'm not allowed to call myself a writer until I have a book. I have a book published, you know, and they've set this self-imposed metric that this title that I'm allowed to call myself is only when this goal is accomplished and therefore they never feel like a writer and then therefore they never act like a writer right and start to tell so i love that that story because you just decided to decide that you're a coach and that you're this is what you're now doing and no one else is questioning otherwise and you're going to make sure that at least your network and the community that you're most familiar with is you know, understanding and most familiar that this is now your journey and can support you. And I think that's a big part that we forget that we need to tell our friends and family and the people we love what our dreams and what our pursuits are. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And it, it didn't take long. Within the first month, um, I got a couple people on Zoom, chatted with them about how I could help. They signed up and I hit my first uh, target. Amazing. Uh, income target. And, and now I just kind of kept doing the same thing. You know, I, was also, for... I was also going to talk a bit about, um, because I talked about unconventional living, which is what I really look at the way, <laughs> um, I don't know if this happened before or after you decided to just be this person and start charging for what it is that you're doing. Um, now, you guys are not in the States where you're from, in New York. You are now in France, in Paris. Yes. <laughs> um, what instigated that, that move? Because you've, you do have a daughter. You've been in New York yes. for a long time. What made you make that move? Yeah, so we're both Californians. We moved to New York to make a big life change in 2007. So this was now 2016. Um, we both felt we didn't want to stay in New York anymore. There was no reason for us to be there. Our daughter had moved to England to go to graduate school. And we were like, we don't even, there's really nothing keeping us here anymore. Um, because with the work that I was doing, I could do it from anywhere. And my husband wasn't working at the time and was sort of in between things. We were dealing with um, a family situation uh, where my father-in-law was at the end stage of his life. So we were kind of like, well, I guess this might be a good time to think about where we want to be. And we had always wanted to live here in France. And so, you know, just to pile it on, we just decided, well, why don't we just try to do that then? <laughs> Let's see if we can actually make this move. And on paper, this looks so stupid. I realized this, you know, I just started a new business. We have no backup money. We, we did have this place over here already. So this was here, but that didn't mean much because we didn't have any money to like make the move. We were living in a tiny apartment in the Bronx that we had bought, but wasn't worth much. And so basically what had to happen was I had to make some income. We had to sell the Bronx place for a certain amount of money so that we could have enough cash to make the move. And all of that finally happened. It took us about 12 months to get all of that together, but we made it happen. And like I said, on paper, looking back, it looks like the dumbest thing ever. Mm. Like nobody would advise you to do something like that at that stage. But I just said, oh, screw it, you know, to use your your word. Yeah. Um, well, in a lot of ways, yeah. you, you kind of also said, screw it and put yourself out yeah. there pretty quickly. You might as well use that momentum of that energy and that magic and just make other life decisions since you're on a roll. Right. Why not? <laughs> since we're going, let's just go. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, um, I, I want to go into sort of how your work has evolved. And we'll talk a, lot, a bit about that um, a little bit later. But before we get there, I want to kind of... Um, talk and converse a little bit about this beginning stage of when people decide that they want to be business owners, they have an interest they want to pursue. Maybe they've been dabbling in a couple things like the blog, you know, same thing with me, screw the cubicle didn't become a real business until I started blogging first. And it was purely just as a blog. I never meant to monetize it until someone asked me, Hey, do you do coaching for career transition? And I had to say, what's a coach? <laughs> <laughs> right. And then, and then I went and go and when do I, you know, do I need to be certified? What kind of coach do I need to be? I'm not a therapist, right, right, right. blah, blah, blah. Um, and that was how it all got started. I never meant for it to do that, but it was interesting because it's already started building an audience uh, for the, the mission, but it, you know, it was a really good sort of warm uh, state of an audience to sort of be more warmed up to products. Right. Even though I never meant mm -hmm. to productize the entire brand at all. Um, 
But people that are starting in this inaugural journey, right, whether it's turning a blog into something that is services or products or deciding that they want to do this line of work, um, I know one of the, one of the hardest things uh, for people to do is simply to start. And to start means such different things to different people because of what they see out there in the world, you know, wide web which mm -hmm. looks like the wild, wild west of internet <laughs> marketers. Um, you know, I call the internet douchebags as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that are just that very specific perspective. They're usually a certain age. They're usually male. They're usually Caucasian, you know, and, and, and there's a trick that you have to buy in order to make sure you get this done. And these promises, these very shiny promises of six figures in six months, uh, you know, swipe my funnel technique and email templates and you will have a six figure launch. And, you know, all these things that unfortunately work as clickbait and people tend to think that it really requires this education of knowing how to, to, to hack the marketplace in some way. And I have a big um, sort of, you know, like a bit of a rant about this, which obviously we've had since we've last talked about how much this is hurting, uh, you know, regular people that, that may not want to start businesses this way or want to fall for something like this when this is the only message out there. Not the only mm -hmm. message, but, you know, the one that has, unfortunately, the most Facebook ad budget behind it. Um, yes, lots of lights flashing around. Lots of lights <laughs> flashing around, uh, limited time offer. There's a time countdown, right? We all have seen that, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so I want to start sharing because a lot of part of my journey was that way as well. But for you as well, um, there was a much more simplified approach that I think would be really beneficial for people to learn about. But what, mm -hmm. like when you were starting out, were there any sort of limiting beliefs or unhealthy uh, messages you saw as well, like kind of what I did, or it, was it something also like your peers or your colleagues at your age group weren't doing these things? Did that at all, you know, make you not want to go f and take that leap? I think that I had to um, set aside a lot of things that I was even seeing at the time and just do the thing that I thought would work, which was get in front of people like get them on a Zoom call with me. And then if we were a good fit, offer them a coaching series. I mean, that's literally all I could really focus on was like, I've got this small audience here. Some of them seem to like me because they email me or they download my books or whatever. So I'm just going to use this pool of people right here who I already have, who are kind of already in my circle and see what I can develop from there. And that's really what I did. I just focused on really deep relationship building with the people who were starting to sort of show up. Um, I did a lot of things like uh, I did some interviews in my little niche that I was in at the time, and that helped me. Um, but I really had to ignore a lot of that shiny object stuff because it just, for me personally, it just didn't fit how I wanted to be in this new role of entrepreneur. I wanted to be a relationship person, not someone who was sending someone to a countdown timer. Right. And, um, and it was so interesting, Lydia, because about eight or nine months into my coaching business, which was life coaching at the time, I started kind of like you, I started getting requests from other coaches saying, well, how did you build this business so quickly? Because I was getting clients regularly and my income was going up and I hadn't even realized that what I was doing was sort of the an real antithesis of what everybody else was trying to do until I started having those kind of conversations with other coaches who were struggling. And I heard them saying things like, oh, well, I have to have, you know, a super fancy website and I have to have you know, some really gorgeous freebie that I'm giving away and I have to do this and I have to, and I was like, actually, you don't need that stuff. Not in the beginning, you know, maybe later some of those things can be helpful, but it's it, what I feel is missing in that whole conversation that's going on. If I can say this is that people don't have a foundation of building relationships and honestly having sales conversations, mm. having the 
calls where you're making a paid offer to a human being on a call. <laughs> and totally. I feel that's just crucial. It's just crucial because otherwise you don't have anything to stand on. You know, you're yeah. trying to build the house with no foundation under it. It oh, just yes. won't work. It Absolutely. Won't work. You know, one of the other things you got so excited, your earbuds fell off. I know. I get so <laughs> passionate about this that I'm losing my mind. No, because yeah. without that foundation, none of those fancy bells and whistles will work. They just yeah. won't. Yeah. I would even, I would even add to that. And that's such a good point is, you know, what I find that people, the, the mistake or, or not the mistake, but the blind spot, I think that's a better word for it, that people tend to have is they're very focused on um, sort of very goal oriented uh, processes, right? They'll, they'll say, I need to have a thousand email subscribers. I need to have X right. number of people on my social media channels. I need to have all these sorts of numbers because they look at the influencers out there in the world that are really successful. They are inspired by them. The Marie Forleo's of the world that I, you know, I love Marie. No, 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 no. Uh, mm -hmm. questions there, but you don't need to be Marie also. <laughs> Marie, no, you don't. right to be able to be successful and and that focus on those metrics that actually don't mean anything even if you had a thousand fans maybe all of them only are there because you 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 trick them into there somehow or they're just mm -hmm. passerbys that maybe might passively consume but conversations are real conversions right that's when someone's actually taking time out of their day to talk to you you know mm -hmm. um but one of the things i want to say about that is that it really sounds like you really focus more on movement rather than goals, right? A movement oh, to me yeah. is, is kind of like, what do I need? To, what is the work? Because we, we've got to do some real work here, uh, ladies and gentlemen, to have successful businesses. And the real work is not um, funnels and, and social media and all those things, especially in the beginning. As Mary said, totally fine if you want to scale and you know do that later. But you almost need a foundation to be riding through with and building that house with that is that is really about like knowing what it is you stand for, what are the types of people you want to work with, what problems are you really solving? Because you don't, if you don't know the problems, you have no reason to charge people because people mm -hmm. want solutions and that's what they, mm -hmm. they are buying. Uh, but also the process that you took, which is those momentum movement goals, rather than a right sticky, like has to be exactly like this goal that you can't control, is that you only dealt with what you can control, which is invitations, telling people what you do and what you're passionate about, and then inviting them to have a human to human conversation. Remember those? Remember Remember those, yeah. those old, good old fashioned talks that people just have on the phone? Well, that is a funnel. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's the best funnel. It's the simplest one. It's the simplest one. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. You share something and you invite people to talk to you. Yeah. It doesn't have to be any more complicated than that. And I don't know why that is getting so lost right now. Uh, and what I see, unfortunately, is a lot of amazing people not doing that mm -hmm. and as a result not having the business that they want or not having you know the kind of life that they want because they are looking way down the line to someplace they just aren't at yet because people are telling them that's what they need to do and they they're just skipping all of this um for me it's just been a beautiful part of my business in fact it still forms the basis of how i earn most of my living is through one-to-one -one personal conversations. I remember, um, I guess it was maybe a couple of years ago, I was chatting with another business coach and we were sharing some figures from our business and I was sharing some income figures and he was like, wow, you must have a really big list. And at the time my list was like 600 and I told him that and he almost fainted. He was like, I thought you were going to say like 10,000. And I'm like, right. no. And he said, well, how is that possible? And I said, because I basically know all of these people. <laughs> right. I basically know all of these 600 people. I've had conversations with most of them, you know, either one-to-one -one or on a, you know, group Zoom call or something like that. And so, you know, I've developed really good relationships with them. Mm. I think that so is kind I of the new I didn't currency. focus on that. Yeah, yeah, that's the new currency exactly. of business. And I think um, I'm so glad we're having this conversation because I think for anyone watching this, and if you actually have a question for us, you know, comment below. But um, these are the sort of not, they're not sexy, super glamorous steps. They're actually just steps that it takes for you to show up. 
actually really show up for people and show up for your work, right? Which is not hiding behind um, an email marketing sequence or a really yeah. snazzy copywriting, because that's not going to yeah. save, save your ass anyway, if you have no um, understanding of, you know, how you want to position your work and what your mission is and how, what your message really needs to be behind mm -hmm. your, your industry, which as a life coach, as you know, there are millions of life coaches out there. And what mm -hmm. are, how are you going to be different, you know? Um, mm -hmm. and, and I want to talk a bit about where your work has evolved because, and then I want to start asking you what has been your go-to simplified, uncomplicated strategies to actually have a sustainable business, okay, for a long time to come. Uh, but how has your work sort of changed from the inaugural life coaching, um, you know, business that you had to what you now do today? Yeah. So as always, it's an up and down <laughs> journey. Uh, I, when I started getting those requests from people asking me how I had built my coaching business, I started kind of morphing more into a business coach, which was really interesting because that's not something I ever thought I would do. But I found that I had something to offer people in that way because I had been able to do it fairly easily and fairly quickly by doing all the things we've been talking about, which are really simple, just, you know, forming relationships and, and basically helping people to learn how to uh, make offers and how to position those offers and how to price them and things like that. And I really enjoyed it. And then uh, I guess it was in the middle of 2019, I had sort of a reckoning, you know, we all have those <laughs> moments, I think, in life and business where, you know, things are kind of chugging along, but something's missing. We, we sort of go, you know, I feel like there's something more that I'm not seeing. And for me, it was like my clients were getting good results, but I wanted to get even better results for them. And I wasn't sure how to do that. And I had a moment in 2019 where I thought about just stopping everything hmm. because I was like, you know, the kind of person that I am, I think I just expect more from myself, not necessarily from my clients, although I do kind of do, but I, I was looking at my own performance and going, something's lacking here and I don't know what it is. And so I started looking into the area of accountability and accountability coaching. And I started realizing that that was something I wanted to bring into my own work. I wanted to bring more of a sense of accountability into my clients and how I design programs to work with them. And so that's what I did. And that really reinvigorated uh, everything that I was doing. My clients started having much better results. I was having a lot more fun again. And it just kind of opened a whole new chapter uh, for how I was working with people. Mm. And, and it's in a lot of ways, you wouldn't have gotten to this realization without doing the inaugural work anyway with coaching exactly. and realizing what the gaps are. Cause that, I, I think every yeah. business in, you know, it's kind of like the second year itch or in the fourth year itch and the sixth year itch, you know, <laughs> it keeps happening because it is a relationship, isn't it? With work. Mm -hmm. um, and as we evolve as humans, and I think our values evolve and what we believe is, you know, much more effective evolves. Um, that's when our work starts to, to, to shift. And so um, is that where your focus is now, where you're much more um, tailor, tailored your, uh, tailoring your coaching towards accountability um, mm -hmm. and, and not as general as the life coaching sort of niche? Yes, exactly. And what's so interesting, though, is that I've realized recently that when I talk about accountability, I'm not really talking about it in the way that I think a lot of people think it is. For me, it's about um, there's, there's very much an infusion of what I was doing as a life coach in the way that I work with people now, where I really support them. I really encourage them to ex explore their own creative resources within themselves, their own capabilities. I kind of push them a little bit to see what they're actually able to do. And I find it's been a good blending of both sides. And it's, it's interesting that you said, you know, you kind of get to an evolution in your business. I would never have seen this with, if I had kept hiding behind, like you said, social media and all of these automated things, you can't learn this stuff that way. It has to come from having lots and lots and lots of conversations with people of putting yourself out there and seeing what happens with what you do. And you just can't be afraid to do that. And when mm. I made this switch, I was very nervous because I was like, this is a really different angle. 
for me. I don't know if people are going to stick with me. What's going to happen? You know, am I going to just tank this whole business? And, and luckily that's not what has happened at all. It's actually gone up rather than down. I think people have appreciated having somebody there who is, you know, really closely watching how they're doing and is willing to step in and help. And again, I want to emphasize something here that what I see in the general conversation out there is a distancing of people and, you know, people, the, the business people from their actual clients and customers. And that is just not helpful. I don't think, I don't know many people who have gone through some of those programs who have actually learned to do anything right. from them. <laughs> you know, I don't, I mean, I'm speaking very candidly. I, I don't yeah. see a lot of big success stories there. And it and was that easy, you know, when these sort of, you know, eight step, eight template, eight, whatever roadmaps, right? And if it was that easy where you literally plug and play, because that's how it's being marketed, isn't it? And yes. people do fall for that and go, well, I'll just plug and play. I don't have to learn much about myself. Just need to go ahead and copy exactly the same thing. And they get out and, and yes, there are some success stories, but they vary depending on experience and, and, and what kind of business owner you want to be. And how much money they have. How much money they invest. have. <laughs> I, absolutely. And I think what, and, and here, I'm going to be quite honest. I have bought those programs. You know, I have spent yes. thousands of dollars in the past doing that. And what it's not that I haven't learned anything at all. There's some tidbits that I, I would take with me, but what I got out of their feeling was that I have lost control of the, the, the flavor or that, that, that inaugural excitement and enthusiasm mm -hmm. I felt with my business back in the day. And now it's mm -hmm. become this machine you know, yeah. and I'm no longer in charge. And I think when that happened to me, and some people may know the story from me talking about it in my past videos is that I had my highest uh, or two years of my highest revenue years, you know, of, of a, a multiple six figure business and having a team scaling, doing all the bigger things. And I remember feeling the most depressed I've ever felt in my business, which was mm -hmm. shocking. Um, and I had a burnout, a massive burnout, because I was working more than I ever was in areas of my work and building it into an empire when actually I don't want it to be an empire. Um, Mary, you've known me for a while. We've coached <laughs> together as well, right? Um, you know, one of the things that we have love for together is lifestyle freedom, right? The mm -hmm. ability to travel, we're big loves of travel and eating and, you know, exploring. And here I was a slave to my business and not a machine that was allowing me to live the kind of life I had because I didn't define myself personally. What was my metric of success? What was my version mm -hmm. of success? Why does it have to be a six figure business to be successful? Mm -hmm. Why does it have to be the scaled product that every coach does and exactly the same trajectory? Like it doesn't have to be those things, you know? Mm -hmm. So what has been like, have you had to have a think about that? And sort of like, what is your enough number or your enough model of a business that allows you to live your life in France with Jeff, see your daughter, play with your cat Starbuck, right? Like all those things <laughs> yeah. that bring joy to your life. Like have, what, what yeah. have you been doing in your business? To, is it tiny is mighty or, you know, what, what's that look like for you? Yeah. I'm really glad you're talking about this because, um, I have never, I, I've always been a solopreneur. I've never even hired a virtual assistant. Uh, I have set things up so that I can manage it myself. Um, and actually the way that I now work with people takes far less of my time, um, which has been really exciting. They get better results. I work fewer hours. That's a nice sweet spot. And my income has gone up mm. and I've really just for myself, I have realized that I have a certain way to, um, bring in business, which is through me. <laughs> People like to interact with me. They like coming to my live talks online, uh, not in person right now. Uh, they like talking to me one-to-one. -one, and that for me has been the best and simplest way to keep fueling my life and my business. And I have to say, you know, I can get kind of emotional about this, but um, since I started my business now over four years ago, I have made the most beautiful friendships. Mm. I have people that I have supported over these four years who I feel like are my dear friends. I've been able to meet some of them in person. Even I went to Japan on a trip uh, in 2019 and I got to meet one of my clients who's in Japan, which was really cool. And so, you know, I look at what has developed 
from me making that decision that day, I'm a coach. You know? yeah. <laughs> I mean, I now feel like I've got, like when I, when I say, you know, my email list is still only a thousand people. But again, I look at the names and I'm like, oh, I know, you know, oh, I wonder what she's doing. You know, I feel like I have this gorgeous circle around mm. me that I didn't have before. And I don't want to lose that. I don't want to lose that. I don't want, you know, Marie Forleo and those people, they, they have what they want. That isn't what I want. I, I wouldn't mind earning more income and I have some goals around that. But it's more important to me to feel this personal connection with people. Yeah. Because what else is there? Really? Absolutely. And I think that is one of the reasons why coaches become coaches. Like we forget that yeah. we, we really want to impact and, 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 and create greater transformation, which is done through in-depth, intimate, personal services. And so yeah. when we think about marketing, and this is what I want to, um, you know, be transparent about this because lots of times we talk about making six figure businesses, but people go, well, how did you do that without doing ads and doing all this stuff? So I want to talk about that a little bit because I am very similar to you in, I have a tiny and mighty business. I plan to keep it this way. I plan to keep it strategically small for my lifestyle choices. And I want to be able to make good money to be able to have my pension and I raise mm -hmm. a family and all the things that I, uh, you know, want to uh, reserve my finances for. Um, but I also, what's really important to me and a huge tagline, of course, for Screw the Cubicle is building a business that feels like you right? Mm -hmm. Which is your values, your strengths, and your personality. And what I've really found, and I want to know from your side as well, um, in terms of how you've done that in order to make great income, right? With doing things like how do you align and choose activities to things like marketing and mm -hmm. promotion and sales that isn't going to feel so formal and robotic, right? Oh, and I'll start yeah. with, I'll start with sharing a couple of my best ways because I think it represents my personality best. And also I've done it since the beginning. Then I didn't do it because I thought it should be more difficult and more complicated. <laughs> and then went back in full circle again and only, and started doing that again. And when I was right the first time, but Hey, you got to do it the other way to see the forest from the trees and see if the grass is really greener and then come back to better pastures. Um, so my favorite thing to, um, for sales, for example, is every time someone, and I'll pick and choose depending on how many subscribers I get for the week. But if someone new comes in on an email list, you know, so they downloaded a, you know, a freebie or a webinar, they watch something right from online, I will send them and I do about five of these a week. So they don't take up a huge amount of my time. They're about a minute each, that's five minutes of my time is I choose five people to surprise with a loom video on email so it's just like hi and then i'm like a little gif you know in their email and then i'll, I'll go say is lydia talking is this really is this really a mass mail or is this a personal and i'll go personal message for you laura you know and so then they'll click on it and i literally go hi laura saw that you watched the webinar training i would love to hear your thoughts and get to know you not sell them anything just literally ask if i'm meeting them at a dinner party and i'm extremely curious about them and their work Okay. Mm -hmm. This has been amazing in helping people get to know me, but also knowing that I'm accessible and knowing that, yeah. um, I care about them and what's going on in their world rather than the only intention to sell. Um, the second yeah. thing is actually collaboration. So things like these, you know, these conversations I get to have with you and many people I've ever, ever invited, um, on the show, this is so easy. And I have this theme for the year of 2020, even though it's not been easy for 2020, um, it's let it be easy. And what mm. are these activities that are marketing activities, but they don't feel like marketing activities because I'm doing it in a way that is joyful, is fun, and is entertaining for me, you know, mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then lastly, just teaching what you know, like not putting people through a funnel or getting them stuck in there so they don't know how to get out of it, uh, but actually just <laughs> freely and, and generosity, you know, the generosity yeah. of sharing and, and going, hey, if you can take it and do it yourself and learn from this webinar and you go ahead and fly for it, awesome work. And if you want some support in doing that, I'm also available, but I want to make sure to, that you need, you got what you need. Um, mm -hmm. and those three things has been really the easiest ways. And I have definitely built a multi multi six figure business on these activities without complicating yeah. stuff. Um, what has That's been awesome. your, if we lift the hood under your business, what has been, you know, your special sauce, special way of getting clients marketing and just, you know, building a, a, a healthy revenue business. Yeah. 
Uh, I love all of your ideas and I do the loom videos, but not as regularly. So I think I'm going to steal that because I like <laughs> great that. Um, steal, steal away. Uh, <laughs> one thing is that I'm really consistent um, about emailing my people on my list. Um, I email them frequently and I'm not often selling something in there. Uh, I'm usually either inviting them to email me back. So I will have, you know, I'll tell like a story and I'll say, you know, what's happening with you? I'd love to hear from you. A lot of people respond that way. And sometimes with those, I will send a Loom video back as, a, as a thank you, you know, so I'll respond personally that way. So that I do a lot is I ask for people to, you know, to write back to me and I answer every single one. Um, the other thing is I offer a ton, like I mentioned, a ton of free talks. I have done this since the beginning. Uh, I've used a lot of different platforms like Crowdcast, Webinar Jam, Zoom. I just love the interaction of a group. And again, oftentimes I'm not selling something on these calls. It's literally just like, here's something that would help you. And if you'd like to talk to me about taking the next step, here's how to get on my calendar. Like that's right. the extent of the selling. That's a 1% that on. out of the whole hundred percent of that webinar. Right. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. That's <laughs> like, I'll mention at the beginning, I'll say, you see the button or here's a link, you know, I'll come back to that at the end. And then I share a bunch of things and we have a wonderful conversation. And what's so interesting about this, Lydia, is that you know, I don't have like a huge audience. So sometimes I'll have, you know, sometimes I'll have, you know, 60 people. Other times I'll have six. And what's so interesting is I've looked at this recently and I've had some of these Zoom calls recently where I've had maybe six to 10 people. And I've still had out of six people, like two of them have signed up to work with me. So you don't need, I want to just shout this from the rooftops. You do not need these gigantic followings to get a really good business going if mm. you focus on connecting with people directly and personally like this. And I'm not knocking the whole scalability thing. I'm, I'm really not. But that can't happen unless you have something to scale. <laughs> you know? If you don't have something to scale, it's not going to work. And so that's really been my go-to is having these personal interactions with people. I enjoy having sales conversations um, that aren't really sales conversations. They're me getting to know someone and then seeing if I can offer them something to help them get to the next level. And if I can't, I just tell them, you know, I don't think I'm the right fit for you, but let me see if I can help you find someone who is. I mean, I literally do that. So it's not rocket science. Yeah. It's, it's, it's just not. It's how do you want to be treated as a person yourself? You know, do you want to feel like a number? I'm on some email lists where I honestly don't think they know or care who I am. That is not the kind of business that I want to have. Mm. period. I will never, ever go in that direction. And if I ever see myself going in that direction, I'm going to stop and reassess. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think those were such great points because I think when you're building a, a personal business and a human to human business, we have to bring back the human vibe. You know, if not, mm -hmm. it's not a human to human business. And the other thing I would love to add to that is that whenever you are a business model that where you are the asset, especially when you first start, you know, you may not be doing courses and, you know, all these sort of scalable products and you never may have to ever do courses if you don't want to, you know, it's not, mm -hmm. you don't have to do anything. Uh, and if you remain as a one-on-one -on -one coach or a one-on-one -on -one consultant or one-on-one -on -one anything, you're also talking a lot about um, premium pricing, right? You don't need as mm -hmm. many clients because these are not 20 dollar clients. These might be clients in the thousand dollar range. And so when yes. you see it that way, where each client is such a value, like, you know, they're paying 2000, 3000, $5,000, whatever it is that people pay to get alone time with you. Those mm -hmm. people, when people pay that kind of money, they need to trust you. And they're not going to trust you just simply by watching an automated video. They're going to trust yeah. you when they get to speak to you and the seeds. And of course, the seeds that you're planting, as you consistently do so much in your email list, consistently planting educational materials, right? Helping them make those decisions small steps at a time. And then maybe one day down the road, someone wants to go steady. Somebody wants That's to right. date, right? But we can't go for straight for the jugular. And I hope that whoever's listening to this that are that's thinking about building their audience and doing this stuff is just get real about it on how, as you said, Mary, how you want to be treated, what is moral and ethical for you to do, and don't do anything that makes you feel sleazy about it. Yeah. I should also say that when you 
do business this way, you will have people who will stick with you forever. I have people who have continually invested in me, with me over the years, over and over and over again. They've, they've followed me from the beginning. They've paid me from the beginning. They are still paying me now because they like what they're hearing. They get something from working with me. And it's a lot easier to have a sustainable business when you're not having to constantly bring in, you know, a thousand new people every week. I, I can't even begin to express the simplicity of, of the business model that I have ended up using. <laughs> yeah. It's like, okay, get to know people, support them, you know, be personable and accessible, like you say, and you're kind of set, mm. you know, and it's not, I have had online programs. I've offered many online courses. However, I don't just set and forget it. I'm, I'm part of it. I'm That's there. Right. I'm answering questions. I'm hosting calls about it. You know, I'm running a group about it. So it's not like people are just out there on their own with no idea of what to do. Mm. So I don't want to make it sound like you have to be on 24 seven because I really don't feel that way. Exactly. I really don't. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, There's ways that yeah. you can create systems and, and, and ways mm -hmm. to not be on every single time, but you know, be there, whatever it is, be there for people and, and not yeah. treat them like a number just because they bought a yeah. course that might be a DIY, you know, exactly. give, offer it in a creative way. Like I was doing, for example, courses where I didn't want to do live calls because I was traveling at the time being in really bad internet spots. So what I did instead of live calls, I said we would do voice messages via Voxer. And that's how yep. I coach you is by voice messages. And that was way better because they're like, great. I don't have, you know, I could be running and, you know, going somewhere, getting groceries, give you a quick message in the car and I get my answer within 24 hours, you know? And so yeah. there's so many creative ways that you can coach, that you can give help and, you know, whatever aligns with your lifestyle choices, this is the way to go. Um, now, before, before we get into how people can kind of find you and learn more about your work, I want to kind of get a final thought that you want to give people. And these are for the people that might be saying to themselves, am I too old to follow my dream? And should I have done that 10 years ago? Or the people that are basically thinking that um, there's more to lose at this stage mm. of life. Uh, and is it worth the risk uh, when maybe I think entrepreneurship is meant for these savvy young folks that can mm. hustle more than mm. I can? <laughs> mm. Gosh, what a great um, question. Well, first of all, my attitude is, is if I'm breathing, I'm not too old to do anything, basically. Amen. <laughs> you know, uh, until I'm not breathing, you know, anything goes. And my attitude is this, is that we don't have to settle for a life that feels mediocre or feels like, oh, it's okay. You know how people, you ask them, how's life? Oh, it's fine. I'm just not okay with being fine. You know, I want people to wake up every day like I do being like, yes, I get to live another day. I get to do this fun stuff. I get to interact with these amazing people, you know, and I, that's what I want people to be able to experience. And if you're not experiencing that, it's time to look at what you're doing and ask yourself, you know, is it the work that I'm doing? Is it just not fulfilling? anymore? Is there something like, you know, Lydia helps people find their skill set and put it to another use, you know, but find the thing that is going to light up your, your life, you know, going forward. Um, to me, there's absolutely, there's more to lose by not doing that. Yeah. You know, I don't want to get to my deathbed and feel like I missed it. I don't want to be lying there going, oh man, you know, I, I, I missed out on the whole, th I don't want to do that. I want to feel like I at least gave it everything that I had. And, you know, you can't take it with you as they say. Mm. So why not just, why not just go for it? There is nothing to lose. Every single time I have ventured further than I thought I could, it's always been awesome over there. <laughs> There's never anything, you know, it looks really scary in that unknown space, but every time you go into it, it's like, Oh, this is awesome. You know, this is mm. great. More learning about myself more experiencing of everything life has to offer. There's nothing bad over there. Yeah. It's how could, how could it not be a gift with the experience? Exactly. It's all a gift. Yeah. It's all a gift. I love that. Thank you so much for that really, really inspiring wisdom. Um, and <laughs> lastly, you. 
for people who really have loved you on the show and just want to know what the hell is Mary doing and how can I get a little bit of that? Uh, where, where can they find you and, and what, are you, what are you working on right now that you would love to invite people to see if they're a good fit to do that? Uh, and if there's any gifts or giveaway or a blog post or anything that you want to share, let us know. Yeah, so they can find me on my website, which is maryshiller.com. That's M-A-R-Y-S-C-H. I-L-L-E-R.com. Uh, right now, I am training people how to either bring accountability into the coaching they are already doing or how to become an accountability coach. So you can find information about that on my site. I also have a button, a big pink button that you can get a really cool download that people have enjoyed called Instant Clients, how to offer the one thing that everyone wants, Love which uh, is pretty fun. And uh, you can also find a ton of books by me on Amazon. So. Sweet. Thank you, Mary. <laughs> we will also be putting the links. Uh, if you're watching this on our YouTube channel, we'll have the links for Mary below in the description. Uh, and if you're watching this in our video blog, we will definitely have her face and all the links that you need underneath. Uh, I can't wait for people to get to know you. You are such a gem. And thank you so much for, well, showing up for just this raw and real conversation where we can have and just not, you know, like I love that I get to have you on and uh, it, it, that you can answer some of these questions around different life stages that I can never answer. Um, but also I, I love that we have a similar approach and I think uh, this would be very encouraging and inspiring for people to just go with ease and start yeah. where you are and don't complicate the process and get your work out there. Yeah. Have fun. It's yeah. All about fun. Definitely. <laughs> Thanks, Mary. Thanks, Lydia.